Over to you, Shimon. Yep. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about improving web core vitals with Drupal. Um, I did a lot of research online uh, before this presentation, and I there's a great deal of material online about web core vitals. And obviously, there's a great deal of material on Drupal, but I didn't really find to these two topic two, two topics in one. So um, it took me quite a while to come up with um, certain things. And most of this, this stuff that I'm going to tell you today are stuff that I have just implemented myself on, on various projects. And I thought I would share some of these tips because um, it has proven to actually improve the web core vitals metrics um, over the course of time. Okay. So just a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago. Although these days I'm based in Thailand, and um, I have been using Drupal uh, for about 17 years now. Um, if you want to find me on Drupal.org, uh, my handle is X amount. Um, there's also, if you need to contact me, there's a contact form there as well. Um, I've been working at Salsa since July 2022 um, as a Drupal training and documentation specialist and senior Drupal engineer. So I do some training around GovCMS and some dev work as well. Um, I'm also like really into SEO and um, web core vitals because I, I like to see how like you can implement one little change and it can have like a massive impact on thousands, even millions of people, right? To me, that is a very exciting thing. So I'm really like um, excited about these kinds of stuff. And I kind of just started a YouTube channel about Drupal and SEO. Um, it's about less than one year old. I only posted one video so far. That's like about a hundred views, but my plan is to like put more videos there in the future. And this picture was uh, from DrupalCon in Washington, DC in 2009. Um, obviously, you know, the guy in the picture is, I'm not talking about me, but the other guy there is Dries. He's the creator of Drupal. Your hair color. All right. Well, that was because I knew I was going to work for Salsa back in 2009. So, it, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, at that point in time, I was still living in Trinidad and Tobago. And just the week before this conference, there was Carnival in Trinidad. And I played Carnival and I had like a red costume and everything. And then, like the day right after I finished, I flew to Washington. So, <laughs> I was really hungover in this picture, actually, and my hair was all red still from the carnival event. So that was why that explains the redness there. Okay. So here are some metrics that people tend to measure. Um, so I'm going to assume that you know what these metrics mean. Um, even if you don't know what it means, you can go to that web dev link there. Um, it will give you a very detailed explanation about each one of these things. Um, there is not enough time for me in this presentation to for me to explain what each one of these metrics mean, right? Even though I would really love to go into detail here, but I just won't have enough time. So um, as, I was, as I was saying in the beginning, I, it took me quite a while to come up with a suitable name for this presentation because you could ask Suchi, like she keep asking me, so what do you want to name it? And I was like, oh, but I want to talk about LCP and I also want to talk about CLS. And, and then I just decided to name it Web Core Vitals and Drupal because I couldn't decide on a specific name at the end. Um, so apart from, so the ones you see at the top, LCP, FID, CLS, these are the web core vitals that Google suggests that you improve because they will ultimately affect your SEO and your page rankings, right? And how it does the page rankings, um, is not the only factor that affects your page rankings. It's just one of the factors, right? Now. There are other metrics that you can measure like INP, which is interaction to next paint, which is a kind of new-ish metric. And that one is like, well, that measures like when you click on some, after your page is already loaded and you click on a button and then something happens, like you expand a menu or something, how fast that that uh, that response is, that is what INP measures, right? And there's, there's others like TTFB, and, TBT, start render, page size, image weight, your long tasks, JS weight, CSS weight. You can Google each one of these to see exactly what they mean. 
Um, the important thing is like metrics evolve over time. So back in the early days, we were measuring like dumb content loaded and page load and these things. And then now we have LCP, FID, and in the future we have NIP. So these things evolve over time, right? Yeah. Um, you ideally you would want to set performance budgets, right? So let's say, and you can implement performance budgets in your pipelines, right? So if you were to create an MR, it can tell you like, okay, if you were to merge this, it would increase your LCP on these pages by this amount or, or, your, or your FID by this amount or whatever, right? Or it would, it would increase your, your image weight or your JavaScript weight by this amount. So if you set budgets and you set them correctly, it, it can be really helpful um, in, in your project overall. And I have some some links there about different ways that you can set budgets. So you can have a look at each one of those. Um, when you have some time, it will give you a much more detailed explanation on how to set that up correctly. Also, you want to make sure that you measure metrics that are meaningful for your site, right? So not everything is going to be applicable to all sites. It can definitely be overwhelming if you were to start tracking everything and then try to improve everything at the same time. Don't try that because you will just be like super stressed out. So just pick a metric, maybe start with the web core vitals, pick one and try to improve that. And then, you know, when you make some headway, you will realize that as you improve one, you might also improve another one or you might also make another one worse, right? Because something, sometimes something has to yield for one to be better. So pick one, and then you know work your way up to the others. Um, out of those links there, I really like um webpagetest.org because that one specifically, I'm not sure if the others do it, but I know this one does it. It allows you to run experiments on the fly. So you can run experiments, let's say like you want to pre-connect to external domains without having to change a line of code. And then you can see what difference it would make if you would implement that change, right? That is called experiments in web page test. So you can check that out. Um, ideally, you should take care of all of these things. Um, these are some of the easy stuff that you can implement. Um, doesn't take, well, some of it doesn't take much time. Some of it might take some time, but these are what I would consider like the low hanging fruit, right? And I could spend like, an entire presentation talking about each one of these things here, right? Um, just by the way, the font size and this tag cloud has no meaning. So let's say like pre-connect has the biggest font. It doesn't mean that pre-connect is the most important one, right? So just disregard the font size for now. Each one is equally important. Um, please re research each one of these individually. You can find a ton of information online on how to um, correctly implement these things. Um, I like to use web.dev. Um, so if you were to take each of these terms and search it on web.dev, it will tell you like the most optimal way that you can implement this um, on your website. Also on web.dev, I tend to find many other like useful tips there also. It's a really great resource. So I highly recommend you check it out. There's also a Google Search Central YouTube channel. And this is where Google posts like SEO talks and latest trends in the industry and so on. So I highly recommend you check that out when you have some time as well. And there's also a Google Chrome developers YouTube channel where they talk about like latest developments in the Chrome web, web browser and latest, latest APIs that you can use that other browsers probably haven't implemented as yet. I tend to get a lot of like good resource material and tips from there as well. Right, so the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about um, some web performance tips in 2023 that most sites do not implement as yet, but it is so easy to implement and it is already available, right? The first one is priority hints. Um, here I have some code on different ways that you can implement this. So the important part here is where you see fetch priority, right? And just by the way, this only works in Chrome as of now, but um, it's an experimental 
API and it will probably be rolled out to the other browsers. But as of right now, it works in Chrome. So what this does, it every, every asset on your site has a priority. Your browser determines what that priority is. Um, priority hints is not, um, is not directly tell any browser what the priority should be. It's just given a hint of what you would like the priority to be, right? So an example, like in the first one there, if you have an above default image, by default, the browser would probably give it a high priority because it's in the viewport. But let's say you wanted that image for some reason to not have a priority of high, this is how you would set it to low. An example of that might be like, you have a carousel in your viewport, right? The initial viewport. The very first image should be high priority, but all the subsequent images should be low priority because they are not actually viewable until the user slides across, right? So you can use fetch priority here to set just the first image high and then all the other images to low, right? Um, you can use it on scripts and on, on uh, as in the second line of code there as well. And you can also use it on iframes as well. So have a Google of fetch priority and you can find some information on web.dev on, on different use cases on how you can implement this. Um, I have an example later on where I, I will show you how I implement this. Uh, another one is HTTP 103 early hints, right? So just to explain what this is, when the when you first load a page, you send a request to the server and then your browser just sits there and waits for like one or two seconds and it does nothing, right? During that time, this is called the server think time. During that time, you know, the server builds the page and then runs these queries in the database or whatever, and then sends the page back, right? That takes about sometimes one or two seconds. And then your browser starts parsing the page, finding the CSS, finding the JavaScript, starts loading images or whatever, right? So early hints is, the, is what the server can send during that server thing time, right? And these are like link headers. So while the browser, sorry, while the server is doing all that processing, you can send these hints to tell the server or to tell your browser start downloading these assets immediately because you will need them, right? So usually you would put like CSS in there because CSS is render blocking and you need that for sure, right? You could also put JavaScript in there or even images in there as well. But don't go too crazy on this because um, you only want to load the things that are really critical for the for the initial viewport. So those these will be like CSS, any JavaScript that is needed in the initial viewport. Not all JavaScript is needed in the initial viewport, right? And especially images that are needed in the initial viewport, like any, like your logo could be a good example or anything about, like, where your menu is, if your menu uses images, right? There's a module called Drupal Server Push. Um, you can check it out. Um, it is not like, it is okay to use, but you have to be careful when you're using it um, because it pushes all your CSS and all your JavaScript, right? And they, I, I did open an issue in HQ for server push to just only push the CSS and give the user the option to give the site administrator the option to push JavaScript or not. Because on some sites, especially the ones that I was working on, I didn't want to push all the JavaScript because I deferred a lot of my JavaScript on, on one site, especially. And server push was just pushing everything, right? But these JavaScript were like analytics, JavaScript, um, Microsoft Clarity, JavaScript, and add to any JavaScript. These were like not critical JavaScript. So there was no need for me to push all these things, right? When you push all these things that are not critical, the server spends time downloading all these non-critical assets when it could have been building out that initial viewport and doing much more critical stuff. So you take away time from something important to do something else, which is not so important, right? So this is just something that you need to be careful when you use this module. Um, Cloudflare CDN and probably other CDNs, I'm not sure, but I know for sure Cloudflare CDNs will issue HTTP 103 early hints for you automatically, and it will grab those from your link headers, right? So if you did use Drupal Server Push, 
then your CSS, and as of right now, all your JavaScript will be included in your link headers. And then if you are using Cloudflare, Cloudflare will use all of those JavaScript and CSS as early hints, and it will do that for you automatically. There is a link um, how Cloudflare implements HTTP early hints. So if you were to just Google Cloudflare, uh, it should be one or three early hints. You will find that link and they will explain in great detail how they have implemented it. But I just gave you the summary of how they did it there, right? So basically they will just take your link headers, cache it in a special cache, and then on a subsequent user, they will send those assets immediately while your page is still building. And then when your page is actually finished built, they will compare what is the CSS and the JavaScript, what is in the actual page. And if it hasn't been updated, then there's nothing to do. It just keeps loading. If it has been updated, they will, I guess, set something in their cache to update the CSS in the early hints cache. I probably didn't give like the best explanation there, but I think it's much better if you just Google it and read that Cloudflare page. Um, they will tell you exactly how they implement that. Okay, so another one that I really like, and this is a really easy one to implement, is using CSS content visibility, right? Um, this can be done at the CSS layer. So if you look on the, the image in the middle there, well, the image on the left, sorry, that whole pink section, if you, let's say that that class was dot story, right? So if you set content visibility on that section, then when, and that, and ideally this works for sections that are lower down the page, right? So what the browser will do is it will load the entire page and that block, that dot story block will just not render until the user scrolls down and it almost gets to that, that part, then it starts all, then the browser actually renders it and does the work to render it, right? And you can apply that, this, this works when you apply it to like, sections lower down on your page, like the footer or any body part that is lower down the page. And it's a really easy thing to implement. And this will greatly reduce your, your render time for the page, right? Um, the browser doesn't know how high that block should be. So there's a there's a there's an additional CSS setting. I think it's called intrinsic value or something that you can set that will estimate that you can set which is actual height, like let's say 500 pixels or whatever. So the browser will just reserve 500 pixels and it will just be blank. And then when you get to there, it will actually render it. And whatever new height it takes, let's say it's more than 500, it will just take that new height and it will disregard the 500. But the reason for including the default of 500 is so that the scroll bar doesn't you know, get that kind of like junky kind of effect. Um, to read more about what I just said there, go to that URL that you see, that web.dev URL, and it will give you a very detailed explanation on um, how to implement this correctly. Um, but I really like this one because it's so easy to implement and it really greatly um, helps with reducing page render time. Um, another one is optimizing long tasks. So there's a new API called is input pending and yield, right? Um, so as it says there, if you use it, if you use these two in combination, it's a great way to get the browser to stop whatever task it is processing so that it can respond to some user input, right? So in the first um the first line, first blue line there, it, there's a long task. And let's say in the middle of that blue line, the user clicked on something, right? What happens is the user then the page, the page the browser has to wait for this task to finish. Then whatever the user clicked on will be activated, right? So with yielding, and if you look at the last line now, if you implemented this correctly, at the time the user clicks, the browser will pause the task and process the click. And then when that is finished, it will just continue from where it left off, right? And this gives the user a much more faster like response, right? So this will improve your INP, your interaction to next paint, 
right? And it gives the user that, you know, this website is really, really responsive, right? So you can have a look at that URL, which will explain in great detail on how to implement this correctly. And it's a quite a long page, actually. Okay, so here's where I will, CSS, I'll talk about CSS background images because this is a special case and a lot of sites use CSS background images. So I'm gonna use a real life example here. This is a website of mine that I built and maintain and it's called classabakes.com, right? And the problem here is um, there are menu icons. So when you, when you click on one of the menu, you get a drop down, and each one of those images is a separate CSS background image, right? It comes from CSS. And it is not discoverable because CSS background images are actually not discoverable by the browser until the browser knows that it needs it. And that is when the user expands the menu, right? So the effect it has, especially on slow connections, is if you want a slow connection and you expand the menu, there'll be all this white space and then the images will start loading and it will start populating one by one. And it gives a kind of like, it gives a kind of like feeling like this website is kind of slow, right? Because the images are still loading, even if you did it, if you clicked on the menu like five minutes later, right? So <clears throat> the browser's preload scanner will not load images until it knows it needs it. And this is especially true for CSS background images. So I will tell you how I solve this problem, right? Um, so the solution number one is, um, first of all, I took all of the images and I made it into one CSS sprite. So that instead of load, loading like 15 small images, I'm just loading one image, right? That was the first thing that I did. And then um, I put, I, I set a preload on that image in the head of the page and I set the fetch priority to low. So I'm using the priority hints here because I want it to load but I don't want it to be a high priority because it's not critical, right? Because when you load, when you go to the page for the first time, the first thing you do is you're gonna read the article on the page. You're not going to expand the menu, right? The majority of the users will just continue browsing down and reading the actual material. So this is why I set the fetch priority to low, right? So that the browser can know, okay, I need this image to, to load at some point. So the browser can discover the image now, right? Even though the image is still in CSS. So the browser's, browser's preload scanner will find and load this image. Um, this is fine for images in the initial viewport. Um, anything in the initial viewport should be considered to be critical. So for most CSS background images, this solution will work and you can just leave it here. But I um, there is a better solution. Preloading, uh, preloading CSS backer images that are part of the LCP should have fetch priority set to high, right? Better yet, don't use it as a CSS backer image. Just put the image directly into the HTML if you can, right? So now I'm going to show you solution two, which is a slightly better solution than solution one. So instead of preloading it, because I have determined that this image is not critical. I am just loading it near to the bottom of the page and I'm not displaying it and I'm setting the fetch priority to low. So what this achieves is that when the browser passes the HTML and gets to the bottom of the page, it's gonna find this image. It's not gonna display it because I set style there, right? And it's gonna load this image at a very low priority. So it's gonna do all the important stuff first and then load this image later. So then when a user clicks on the menu, the image is already there and, and waiting, right? So why I put this in the HTML is because the browser's preload scanner will find this image if you put it directly in the HTML. Anything you put directly in the HTML, the browser will find. And um, this works in this specific case because this image is not critical. If your image is critical, you're better off doing solution one, right? Which is just preloading it in the header. And if it's absolutely critical, you set fetch priority to high. So, so your logo, for example, right? HTML is really fast, right? So um, your browser's preload scanner will find and load all 
like your source attributes in HTML, including poster images in video, which is a kind of neat feature. So if you have a video, you can put a poster image, which is like a thumbnail version before the user actually plays the video. And the browser will preload all of these things for you automatically. If you want your assets discoverable in the fastest possible way, put them directly in the HTML and avoid loading them from CSS and JavaScript, right? That is the most optimal way to load them. HTML is super fast and JavaScript is the fastest way to build a slow website because every website has JavaScript and we all love JavaScript, but you know, JavaScript is something that it just loads later down the pipeline and it makes the website a little bit slow, right? Um, so <clears throat> I'm gonna just talk about some common mistakes that a lot of sites make. Um, first big one is that we tend to lazy load everything, all images, right? Especially images that are considered for the LCP, largest, largest contentful paint. If your image is in the viewport, you should not lazy load that image, right? Because what will happen is the browser will load everything and then you, it sees lazy loading set to lazy and then it loads that like load on the pipeline. And then you kind of scratch your head wondering, well, why is this image the LCP and why is the LCP so bad? It's because you probably lazy loaded, lazy loaded that image, right? So lazy load every other image except images in the viewport. And there's a quick CSS trick. If you apply that CSS, um, it will, and you look at your page, if you see like a blue border in the viewport of any image, that means that you are lazy loading an image in the viewport and you should try not to do that. <clears throat> Another common mistake is um, sites tend to preload and pre-connect to everything, right? So if you, if you preload all your images and preload all your JavaScript and all your CSS, you prioritize everything, right? But then nothing, if you prioritize everything, then nothing is prioritized at the end of the day, right? So only preload, pre-connect to critical resources. And I'm highlighting on the word critical here because critical here means if it's in the initial viewport, then you should preload it. If it's not absolutely necessary and it's not concerned with the initial viewport, for example, analytics code, then you should not preload it, right? So we tend to use the advanced AGG module, advanced aggregation module, and there's an option to set um, pre-connects to external domains. And if you check that box, it will find any external libraries that you use and just pre-connect every one of them. I like to turn this off because I like to customize exactly what I pre-connect to because not everything that you want to Pre-connect to is critical for the initial viewport, right? <clears throat> so I look at a page and I look at the initial viewport and I, I determine what is critical and I just connect to those, I pre-connect and preload those resources only. I think it's hard for the advanced aggregation module to determine <clears throat> what is in the initial viewport. And it just basically pre-connects to everything. I've seen some sites inline all CSS. Um, don't do that because it defeats like all your cache in and, and your CDNs if you use it. <clears throat> so if you, if you hit one page with all your CSS in line and then you hit a second page, then the browser still has to like load all those CSS again. There's not any cache, right? Um, don't use complex CSS. <clears throat> so try to keep your CSS tree small, right? If you can target a direct class or ID, then just do that. Don't like, you know, keep nesting, nesting, nesting three, four layers down because the browser has to calculate all of these things. And this increases the um, render time of your page. <clears throat> so keep your CSS really small and tidy uh, as much as possible. In your views, um, views tend to input um, default HTML and CSS. In, in your page, right? So, or in your view block. So if you are not using the default HTML, for example, this would be like adding odd and even to rows or adding like default HTML for fields and so on, right? If you're not using these things and you're not actually using it in your CSS, 
then it's not needed. And if you remove it, it's going to reduce your total like HTML uh, payload at the end of the day, right? So you can disable those things, especially removing like um, removing. I've seen sites where they have fields and filters in their views, but they're not even using it. Like for example, they might have a field, and they might just hide the field. And the field, and when you really check it, that field is not even used in the view. It's just there because some previous developer thought it might be needed and they included it, right? <clears throat> so if you trim your views like that, it will reduce the SQL query count for the page, right? Which would ultimately increase your page load time and TTFB, time to first byte. So have a look at your views and try to make them smaller. That's what I'm saying. Um, I think I mixed up the last two points there, but turn off the default CSS and HTML that comes from your view, and this will reduce your HTML down tree. Um, so every kilobyte counts in this case, right? Um, if you try to develop a site, well, most people develop is develop sites first, and then afterwards they try to like optimize it and try to trim things, right? <laughs> it will be very hard to like try to do it that way. If you like were like you know mindful of this while you were actually developing a site, you know, it would be actually easier because and a, a typical a typical example is you know, you you write a bunch of CSS and then afterwards you try to optimize that CSS, but it's really difficult at that point because now you have to go rewrite everything, right? If you were like targeting directly classes and, and IDs and so on in the beginning then you know every line of CSS that you save, it, it really helps at the end of the day, right? So this is something that if you can't do it from like the beginning of a project in, or early on in the stages of a project, it, it'll be much um, easier to achieve in the long run. And that's about it. So I'm not sure how we're doing on the time here, but um, I can take some questions. If you guys have any. Uh, so, Shivan, uh, this said, Govin, I have one question regarding that you mentioned about uh, uh, the viewport loading. Uh, when users scroll, it will render uh, the HTML. If you just scroll to this one, right? Yes, yes. So, uh, it, it will work for the bot as well. Like, uh, if uh, search engine bot will just uh, crawl the data, it will like yeah. random the data so, um, so what I what I what I what I thought about that, right? So like the the HTML still exists. In mm -hmm. So if you like let's say you're at the top of the page and you load for the first time and then you did a text search for something in that pink section, <clears throat> you will still find it because the HTML still exists. So if you did a text search and you jump directly to that section, then your browser will just load that section immediately at that point. So it, it is still searchable and still accessible, even to like um, screen readers and so on, right? It's just not rendered at that point. But the, okay. because the HTML still exists, it, it means it's still accessible, right? But um, if you go to that link, mm -hmm. it explains uh, very detail about what you just asked. Actually, there's a section on that. Okay. Anyone has any other questions? All right. It seems we don't have any more questions. Thanks a lot for your um session, Shiva. I'll now stop recording. <laughs>